BOA one the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Dan Friedel, Anna Mateo, and John Russell. Later, we will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first... Young scientists in Cape Town, South Africa, are working to reverse engineer the Moderna coronavirus vaccine. That means they will carefully study all the vaccine parts to see how it was made so they can make a similar product. The World Health Organization is supporting the effort. It is organizing creation of a vaccine research training, and production center in South Africa, along with a system to gather needed materials. The effort aims to make vaccine treatments available for the world's poorest people. Emil Hendricks is a 22-year-old scientist for Afrogen Biologics and Vaccines, the company trying to reproduce the Moderna vaccine. He said, we are doing this for Africa at this moment, and that drives us. We can no longer rely on these big superpowers to come in and save us. Some experts see reverse engineering as one of the few remaining ways to deal with the power imbalances of the pandemic. The international organization People's Vaccine Alliance reports that poor countries have received about 0.7% of COVID-19 vaccines produced so far. The organization says wealthy countries have received almost 50%. The United Nations COVAX program is working to spread vaccine supplies more evenly across the world. But so far... The effort has failed to ease severe shortages in poor countries. Vaccine donations are far fewer than need demands, and drug makers have resisted international pressure to share vaccine resources. The Cape Town Center aims to expand access to the new messenger RNA technology that Moderna, Pfizer, and German partner BioNTech used in their vaccines. The WHO has never directly involved itself in attempts to reproduce drug products of private companies that object to such efforts until now. This is the first time we're doing it to this level, because of the urgency and also because of the novelty of this technology, said Martin Fried. He is a WHO vaccine research coordinator who is helping direct the center. Dr. Tom Frieden is the former head of the United States Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. He says the world is being held hostage by Moderna and Pfizer, whose vaccines are considered the most effective against COVID-19. The United States is demanding that Moderna increase its vaccine production for use in poor nations in exchange for the American financial support it received to develop the product. The worldwide shortage through 2022 is estimated to be between 500 million and 4 billion doses. David Kessler is the head of Operation Warp Speed the U.S. program supporting COVID-19 vaccine development. He said the U.S. government has been a very important part in making Moderna the company it is. 
They understand what we expect to happen, Kessler said. Moderna has promised to build a vaccine factory in Africa at some time in the future. But some poorer countries refuse to wait any longer. Petro Terblanche is Afrogen's supervising director. She said the company aims to have a version of the Moderna vaccine ready for testing in humans within a year. We have a lot of competition coming from Big Pharma. They don't want to see us succeed, Terblanche said. They are already starting to say that we don't have the capability to do this. We are going to show them. If the team in South Africa succeeds in making a version of Moderna's vaccine, the information will be publicly released for use by others, Terblanche added. Mass production of copies of the vaccine could become a property law issue. Moderna has said it would not seek legal action against a company that violated its property rights. However, it also has not offered to help companies that have volunteered to make its mRNA shot. Moderna leader Nubar Afayan said the company decided it would be better to expand its vaccine production than to share technology. The company plans to provide billions of additional doses next year. The mineral-rich island of Greenland, a semi-autonomous territory of Denmark, has a large amount of an ancient rock known as anorthosite. Anorthosite is similar to the rock that astronauts collected from the moon in the early years of American space exploration. Scientists believe anorthosite is nearly as old as Earth itself. Anorthosite is found in southwestern Greenland, and it has mining companies excited about making money. The rock contains compounds that can be used to make fiberglass and aluminum. People who support taking the minerals out of the ground note that the money earned may help Greenland reach its long-term goal of independence from Denmark but a conflict might be coming. Naya Natanielsen is Greenland's Mineral Resources Minister. She said, not all money is worth earning. She added that Greenland is willing to make fast decisions when it comes to protecting the environment. The island's new government campaigned on a platform of environmental responsibility. It recently banned future oil and gas drilling. The government may begin a new ban on mining for uranium. A ban on uranium mining in Greenland was lifted eight years ago. A new ban would halt development of one of the world's largest rare earth deposits. The metal deposit was an important issue in the elections held earlier this year. Greenlanders worry that uranium mining could cause environmental problems. The head of the company that holds the mining rights in the area called the concerns exaggerated or greater than they need to be. John Mayer of Greenland Minerals told the Reuters news agency that uranium is a political issue which is being driven by exaggerated and misleading claims. If the mine remains operational, the government estimates 
it could bring in $233 million each year for Greenland. Currently, the island's 57,000 people mostly depend on money from fishing and the financial support it gets from Denmark. But Denmark would reduce the amount of money it sends to Greenland based on future earnings from mining. Some Greenlanders believe the mining should stop until the island is independent from Denmark. But some people in Greenland support mining. We have to find other ways to make money. We can't just live off fishing, said Johannes Hansen. He is a local firefighter and carpenter. His town of nearly 160 people is about 50 minutes by boat from a planned anorthosite mine. Greenland anorthosite mining is a company developing the mine. It has a plan to process 120 metric tons of anorthosite for possible buyers in the fiberglass industry. Anorthosite is a more environmentally friendly choice than some other materials, including kaolin. A spokesperson for Greenland Anorthosite Mining said anorthosite melts at a lower temperature than kaolin, and it produces less waste and greenhouse gases. The company says it hopes to have an exploration permit by the end of 2022. The bigger aim is for a anorthosite to be used instead of bauxite to produce aluminum. Aluminum is one of the minerals important to reducing greenhouse gases. It can make vehicles lighter and is fully recyclable. I'm Ana Mateo. And I'm Dan Friedel. Halloween is this weekend, a holiday with ancient beginnings. The yearly celebration now looks much different than it did in the distant past. For example, many Americans now celebrate the holiday by watching scary movies or scary shows at home. In today's Everyday Grammar, we will explore some famous words from Scream, a scary movie. You will learn about questions, auxiliary verbs, and pronunciation. In the 1996 film, a killer calls a woman who is alone in her house. The killer wants to scare her. He asks the following question. You like scary movies? Uh Uh-huh. This is what you might call a yes or no question. It is asking for either a yes or a no answer. Note that the general structure is this. Auxiliary verb plus subject plus main verb plus rest of the sentence. In our example, do is the auxiliary verb, you is the subject, like is the main verb, and the words scary movies make up the rest of the sentence. Note that the main verb is in the simple present. The simple present does not necessarily express present time. It also expresses what is generally true. We have explored the line from the movie at the level of grammar. But we can also explore the line as a meeting point between grammar and pronunciation. Let's listen again. You like scary movies? Uh Uh-huh. Did you notice that the word do is difficult to hear? That is because Americans often reduce, meaning to say in a softer and shorter way, function words. Function words are words that have a grammatical purpose. These can include pronouns and auxiliary verbs, 
and other words such as articles and prepositions. On the other hand, Americans often stress content words, words that include verbs, nouns, adjectives, and so on. In our example, the words like scary movies are content words. So, if all of the words were spoken clearly, our question would sound like this. Do you like scary movies? But it sounds like this with the reduced function words. Do you like scary movies? Some Americans might even reduce the word you even further and say something like this. Do you like scary movies? Today's report explored one line from a scary movie. But you can take what you have learned to study any kind of movie or speaking situation. Pay careful attention to yes or no questions. Note the auxiliary verb and the main verb. And then ask yourself which words were stressed or reduced. With time and careful study, you will master not only English grammar, but also develop a strong understanding of how native speakers produce all kinds of words, statements, and questions. I'm John Russell. Welcome to The Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. Just before sunrise on April 12, 1861, the first shot was fired in the American Civil War. A heavy mortar roared, sending a shell high over the harbor at Charleston, South Carolina. The shell dropped and exploded above Fort Sumter, a United States military base on an island in the harbor. The explosion was a signal for all Confederate guns surrounding the fort to open fire. Shell after shell smashed into the fort. The booming of the cannons woke the people of Charleston. They rushed to the harbor and cheered as the bursting shells lighted the dark sky. Jack Moyles and Stuart Spencer tell about the attack on Fort Sumter. Confederate leaders ordered the attack after President Abraham Lincoln refused to withdraw the small force of American soldiers at Sumter. Food supplies at the fort were very low, and Southerners expected hunger would force the soldiers to leave. But Lincoln announced he was sending a ship to Fort Sumter with food. Confederate President Jefferson Davis ordered his commander in Charleston, General Beauregard, to destroy the fort before the food could arrive. The attack started from Fort Johnson, across the harbor from Sumter. A Virginia congressman, Roger Pryor, was visiting Fort Johnson when the order to fire was given. The fort's commander asked Pryor if he would like the honor of firing the mortar that would begin the attack. No, answered Pryor, and his voice shook. I cannot fire the first gun of the war. But others could, and the attack began. At Fort Sumter, Major Robert Anderson and his men waited three hours before firing back at the Confederate guns. Anderson could not use his most powerful cannons. They were in the open, at the top of the fort, where there was no protection for the gunners. Too many of his small force would be lost if he tried to fire these guns. So Anderson had his men fire the smaller cannon from better protected positions. These, however, did not do much damage to the Confederate guns. The shelling continued all day. 
A big cloud of smoke rose high in the air over Fort Sumter. The smoke was seen by United States Navy ships a few miles outside Charleston Harbor. They had come with the ship bringing food for the men at Sumter. There were soldiers on these ships, but they could not reach the fort to help Major Anderson. Confederate boats blocked the entrance to the harbor, and Confederate guns could destroy any ship that tried to enter. The commander of the naval force, Captain Fox, had hoped to move the soldiers to Sumter in small boats, but the sea was so rough that the small boats could not be used. Fox could only watch and hope for calmer seas. Confederate shells continued to smash into Sumter throughout the night and into the morning of the second day. The fires at Fort Sumter burned higher and smoke filled the rooms where soldiers still tried to fire their cannons. About noon, three men arrived at the fort in a small boat. One of them was Louis Wigfall, a former United States senator from Texas, now a Confederate officer. He asked to see Major Anderson. I come from General Beauregard, he said. It is time to put a stop to this, sir. The flames are raging all around you, and you have defended your flag bravely. Will you leave, sir? Wigfall asked. Major Anderson was ready to stop fighting. His men had done all that could be expected of them. They had fought well, against a much stronger enemy. Anderson said he would surrender if he and his men could leave with honor. Wigfall agreed. He told Anderson to lower his flag and the firing would stop. Down came the United States flag and up went the white flag of surrender. The battle of Fort Sumter was over. More than 4,000 shells had been fired during the 33 hours of fighting, but no one on either side was killed. One United States soldier, however, was killed the next day when a cannon exploded as Anderson's men prepared to leave the fort. The news of Anderson's surrender reached Washington late Saturday, April 13th. President Lincoln and his cabinet met the next day and wrote a declaration that the president would announce on Monday. In it, Lincoln said powerful forces had seized control in seven states of the South. He said these forces were too strong to be stopped by courts or policemen. Lincoln said troops were needed. He requested that the states send him 75,000 soldiers. He said these men would be used to get control of forts and other federal property seized from the Union. Lincoln knew he had the support of his own party. He also wanted Northern Democrats to give him full support. So, Sunday evening, a Republican congressman visited the top Democrat of the North, Senator Stephen Douglas. The congressman urged Douglas to go to the White House and tell Lincoln that he would do all he could to help put down the rebellion in the South. At first, Douglas refused. He said Lincoln had removed Democrats friends of his, from government jobs, and had given the jobs to Republicans. Douglas said he didn't like this. Anyway, he said, 
Lincoln probably did not want his advice. The congressman, George Ashman, urged Douglas to forget party politics. He said Lincoln and the country needed the senator's help. Douglas finally agreed to talk with Lincoln. He and Ashman went immediately to the White House. Lincoln welcomed his old political opponent. He explained his plans and read to Douglas the declaration he would announce the next day. Douglas said he agreed with every word of it, except, he said, 75,000 soldiers would not be enough. Remembering his problems with Southern extremists, he urged Lincoln to ask for 200,000 men. He told the president, You do not know the dishonest purposes of those men as well as I do. Lincoln and Douglas talked for two hours. Then the senator gave a statement for the newspapers. He said he still opposed the administration on political questions, but, he said, he completely supported Lincoln's efforts to protect the Union. Douglas was to live for only a few more months. He spent this time working for the Union. He traveled through the states of the Northwest, making many speeches. Douglas urged Democrats everywhere to support the Republican government. He told them, There can be no neutrals in this war, only patriots or traitors. the North, thousands of men rushed to answer Lincoln's call for troops. Within two days, a military group from Boston left for Washington. Other groups formed quickly in northern cities and began training for war. Lincoln received a different answer, however, from the border states between North and South. Virginia's governor, said he would not send troops to help the North get control of the South. North Carolina's governor said the request violated the Constitution. He would have no part of it. Tennessee said it would not send one man to help force southern states back into the Union. But it said it would send 50,000 troops to defend southern rights. Lincoln got the same answer from the governors of Kentucky, Arkansas, and Missouri. For several days, it seemed that all these states would secede and join the Southern Confederacy. Lincoln worried most about Virginia, the powerful state just across the Potomac River from Washington. A secession convention already was meeting at the state capitol. On April 17th, the convention voted to take Virginia out of the Union. Virginia's vote to secede forced an American Army officer to make a most difficult decision. The officer was Colonel Robert E. Lee, a citizen of Virginia. The Army's top commander, General Winfield Scott, had called Lee to Washington. Scott believed Lee was the best officer in the Army. Lincoln agreed. He asked Lee to take General Scott's job to become the Army chief. Lee was offered the job on the same day that Virginia left the Union. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.